also very glad to be moderating this panel on the legends of computer gaming, because the great thing about being a moderator is that you can get fame by association. And uh, it's a real privilege to be with these giants in computer game history and computer game future. And uh, I'm really excited about the chance to interview these gentlemen in front of you. But uh, I have to start off with some ground rules and just point out that very obviously, no list of computer game legends can ever be exhaustive. And if you know, we wanted to talk about people who possibly had done some of the most thought-provoking games, if not most commercially successful, we would have to talk about Chris Crawford and the, and the contribution that he made to uh, computer gaming. And if we're going to talk about multiplayer gaming, we'd have to talk about Danielle Barry and the push that, that she had from the very beginning, whether it was uh, in Cartels and Cutthroats or Mule or uh, uh, the Robot Rascals game or whatever. There was always a concern with multiplayer gaming, way anticipating the idea of online gaming. And uh, if we were going to talk about role-playing games, I think we'd have to uh, uh, insist that Lord British would be a part of this picture. So uh, if we were to talk about strategy games in specific, we'd have to make Sid Meier a part of this picture. And uh, I'm sure that each and every one of you could think of about three or four people that you would like to have uh, on this panel. But, you know, if you have to start somewhere, this Hall of Fame starts way up here. And I'm very pleased to be on here with uh, Nolan Bushnell, uh, the video game pioneer. Yes, very Chris Roberts, who most of you know because of the phenomenal success of the Wing Commander series. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, even some of his games that get less attention... Uh, like uh, Times of Lore that pushed us uh, towards some iconic interfaces and, uh, and like Bad Blood that, uh, that was even pushing uh, Richard in some of the areas of uh, object-oriented programming and, uh, and Strike Commander that caused many people to uh, upgrade to a 486 uh, even if they eventually didn't like it. Uh, uh, <laughs> And of course, later on, we'll talk about the Wing Commander Syndrome and how it's killing the industry. But <laughs> <laughs> and then, without a doubt, you know, the person who proved to us that shareware was viable and wasn't second-tier minor league anymore, the person who proved to us that first-person perspective was the real logical way to immerse people as quickly as possible into games, and the person who is probably most responsible for giving us the id interface that gamers complain about if it's not in everybody's first-person game. And without a doubt, and proven many times over again, the world's foremost Doom and Quake player, John Romero. <laughs> So the ground rules are no softball questions. I'm going to try to ask some tough ones. I'm going to try to bait some of these guys here. And then later on, we're going to go out Phil Donahue style into the audience of those few of you who uh, got in the multimedia theater. And we're going to give you a chance to ask questions and see if you can stump the panel. So I'm looking forward to this time together. And so uh, without any further ado, let's uh, move right along. Nolan Bushnell. A lot of people think of you as the founder of the video game industry, but basically you really started making your bones in the coin-op industry, where you were substituting uh, Space War and then Pong for, uh, for uh, pinball machines. In fact, they, uh, they say that not only was Atari Games really successful, but that you owned your closest competitor, something called Key Games, and that sometimes those games were delivered in the same truck with just the sign change. Is that true? It was absolutely true. We, uh, there were two major distributors in each town, and we found that when we sold to one guy, they wanted an exclusive. And so I really didn't want the other guy selling somebody else's game. So I felt that I should have that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's a lot of people here that wish they could own their top competitor. So it was Atari games and key games. And um, then uh, all of a sudden, the console revolution uh, came across. And, uh, and you let out in that with the 2600. But the scuttlebutt is that uh, there was a time where you were about to pull the plug on the project and that uh, Al Alcorn came in and talked you into going ahead. And the rest was history. It was actually uh, before that. The, uh, the 
Pong was originally a dedicated chip. It was an in-channel uh, MOS chip, and uh, it just had all kinds of bugs in it and various things. And that was when I almost pulled the plug. And then, you know, it's, it's funny that people think that pioneering is easy. Um, but in fact, we couldn't sell the Pong game. Uh, we went to all the toy companies, or the toy distributors, uh, retailers. They said, no, it's too expensive because we were going to sell it at $99. Uh, and then later on, we said, okay, we'll go to the TV distribution. And they didn't want it because they said, gee, we'll have to finance and it looks like a fad. And literally, we tried to market it for almost three months. Not a taker. Not a taker. And it wasn't until uh, we happened to call the buyer, the sporting goods buyer, at Sears and Roebuck. And uh, we called him, told him what he had. He says, okay. And the next morning, at 8 o'clock, he was on our doorstep, said, how many can you build? We thought, 25,000, maybe, standing on our head. <laughs> uh, so we told him 75. <laughs> and, uh, and he came back with an order for 150,000. <laughs> and as we say, the rest is history, except for one thing. Uh, we had to price it before we had the foggiest clue about how much it cost to manufacture. <laughs> and, uh, and we also didn't have enough money to build it. Other than that, there's no problem. Um, but uh, we just said, hey, in order to do this, we're going to need to get a line of credit. He says, not to worry. Sears Bank. <laughs> you know, so it was a partnership made in heaven. And... Um, so we pushed it through. See, a lot of people don't realize that games on a TV is a really stupid idea. <laughs> and, that, uh, and that the company started with $250, not because I wanted it that way, because nobody would invest. They thought it was a stupid idea. They, they confused the frivolity of the activity with the frivolity of a business. They said, you know, how can you make money on fun? And this was a long time ago. <laughs> well, they're still asking that question today. Exactly. <laughs> Different reasons, Flo. So uh, since somebody took a chance on you, you took a chance on a whole lot of people. A lot of folks think that uh, after you left Atari that uh, Chuck E. Cheese was uh, your primary interest, but you had like uh, a half dozen high-tech companies that you lumped under the Catalyst Industries, Mark. And, uh, Actually, there were 17 in the Catalyst umbrella. Ah, that's good. Did any of them make money? Uh, the one I watched, Androbots, I don't think did, but... Uh... Androbot was a sore disappointment. That... Uh, that was probably... But you might not explain to some of the younger folks what Androbots did. <laughs> Androbot was a little guy that ran around and you know, got you beer and sang songs and told jokes. It was the idea of a personal robot. And it was one of those things that I just... You know, you can't read Isaac Asimov without thinking that there's going to be a real robot in the future. <laughs> um, so I decided to build one. Um, and the neat thing about it is we got it going, we got some of the things working, but the damn thing um, was a mobile computer. And a mobile computer at th that time in, in the static electricity environments was not a pretty sight. Because <laughs> uh, if you stop to think about it, syntax error or a frozen cursor is one thing. But if you get frozen in a robot with FFFF, all of a sudden you're full speed right into the wall. <laughs> uh, in fact, in a robot lab that I was playing around with at, uh, at Stanford, I actually saw an end effector on a program bug thrown right through a, a cinder block wall. Um, you know, FFF, <laughs> boom. Um, so robots were kind of an interesting thing. But it was one of those areas where we were so trying to solve too many things. Power problems, static. I mean, this was 1983, 84. But more than that, uh, we really got screwed by one of the big investment houses um, in which they agreed to raise all kinds of money for us uh, two days 
the, the thing was totally oversold, totally oversold. Uh, you know, people were calling saying, Nolan, can you get me stock? Can you get me stock? And some executive at that unnamed jerky company uh, rolled over one day in the morning and said, we don't want to do development stage companies anymore, and pulled the plug on it. Not because of the sales of the thing, not because of the company, because of a whim and fancy of an elephant. So if you ever get in, you know, the stall with an elephant, you've got to be careful, because they can get rolled over on. So what happened in that case is that since everyone knew the company was oversold, they said, ah, must be something wrong with it. And it sort of tainted it, dried up the sources of capital on the thing, boom, had to sell it for, I had about $17 million in the thing, sold it for two. Not a giggle. Mm. Anyway, um, Magna Microwave uh, is doing a couple hundred million now. Mm. Um, ETAC, you guys all know that, Automobile Navigation, just sold to Sony for a couple hundred million. I sold it to News Corp for 50, too soon, too fast. Um, that was when John Power. Evans was there? Yeah. Pardon? That was when John Evans was there? Yeah. Um, ETAC, there was there's quite a few of them. Closed several real turkeys down, though. You know, <laughs> certain things that look like they're a good idea. We had an automatic... Uh, color shade matcher called Iro in the cosmetics business. Never go to there. Technologists in a cosmetics business, fish out of water. You don't want to do that. Um, Great. It was good, some, some good fun. Okay, well, I got, got to hit you with one embarrassing question before we move on to one of the others, and then we'll come back and let you talk about the exciting thing that you're doing now in the games area. Okay. But, um, you know, um, I happened to be at the LA press conference that was part of the CDTV launch, and... Um, <laughs> And uh, basically, uh, you made a very interesting statement there that I thought you might want to clarify uh, before all these uh, game developers. And uh, that was that the educational potential of the CDTV was sort of to make up to the world what you had inflicted upon them with video games. <laughs> well, you know, CDTV was one of those things where I consider it on one way a huge success. Um, not in what you sold, but, but basically... I like to say that I proved for $8 million and in eight months what it took Trip Hawkins $200 million <laughs> three years to sell. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. Uh, the, uh, I actually still believe that if we look at the future, that we control a lot of power in video games. We, we control power to communicate. We, we can focus attention. We can do things dynamically and excitingly. And I think that we, somewhere along the line, do always need to give back to society things that we have prospered by. And I think that truly we can and will solve the educational crisis in the world. And that in some ways, if we call it ET, not extraterrestrial, but educational technology, I really believe it's going to have more power in the world than biotechnology. And I believe that the people sitting in this room have a lot of that power. And that if we can train people 100, 200, 300 times faster and more efficiently through using the tools that we take for granted. I think we're going to really change the nature of the world. And because right now, we are seeing people holding on to the future by the tips of their fingers. And that's because the technology that we have is so powerful, so wonderful, such an enabler for a great life and yet it's, it's held by the priesthood and not by the congregation. And I think that it's our goal, or it should be, to steal ourselves for creating the tools by which we permeate technology into the masses. And if we do that, then we've really accomplished something. Anyway. <clears throat> yes. 
Well, at this point, I want to move to uh, Chris Roberts. And uh, if we uh, had the, the slide from my computer up, it would be a quote from my favorite uh, review of one of Chris's products. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I wouldn't um, think that would be a quote for one of John's products. <laughs> Normally, you would think yeah. of it as a quote for one of John's products. But uh, long, long ago in the bad blood days, uh, one of our reviewers took exception of one of those skinks-like uh, puzzles where... Um, in this case, you had to kill this little turtle-like creature and, uh, and get the blood out of it vampirically in order to survive. <laughs> and uh, you know, I guess this was the nascent uh, animal activist in Charles, and he thought it was uh, morally reprehensible. And uh, I, I know that the folks at Origin were quite upset at us for a long time over that review. Uh, but uh, I want to talk to you about some of the, the more exciting things. Uh, for example, um, um, I remember when you first came over from, from England and you were working on Times of Lore, and uh, Richard was trying to describe the Times of Lore interface to us. And uh, he was all excited, and he made the mistake of calling it a Nintendo-like interface and saying that we're changing everything to that, you know. And uh, it just, you know, panicked those of us who uh, uh, equated the Nintendo-style uh, game with being shallower than the, uh, than the PC game. And uh, yet when we saw the game, uh, it was uh, extremely deep, and it surprised us. And... Uh, uh, we did notice that uh, the influence went on toward iconic interfaces. Um, what do you think the, the most important contribution, whether it was in, in interface or whether it was in interactive sound or whether it was in uh, object uh, definition in games, it, what is the most important contribution in all your tenure at Origin, do you think? Um, well, I mean, I, the, the biggest thing I always try and do in everything I do is I want to immerse the player in the environment. And so I think that what I'm proudest of with Wing Commander, what I've done in the past, is any time that I sort of remove the feeling of interface. So, you know, like when it's in Wing Commander, instead of, you know, you going over and going on file and save, you click on a bunk bed to save, or you, you know, click on the airlock door to exit the game. And, um, I mean, I guess the coolest thing from my standpoint is from putting it into something like Wing Commander and then seeing that sort of graphical immersive interface sort of permutate other people's games, which is kind of cool. Um, but, I mean, that's, for me, all I want to do is I want to build an experience that I get lost in a world for two hours, 20 hours, 40 hours, and uh, have a good time. And so I guess that's what I like the most. I think uh, your contributions to interface have been very important because I've seen it across, you know, lots of uh, different uh, game companies. Uh, just like John's contributions to interface have been very, very important uh, at a later period. There was one thing that you tried in Wing Commander, uh, the first Wing Commander, that I thought was extremely important and uh, extremely significant, and yet it turned out that when the gamers got hold of it, it was uh, something uh, of a failure. Uh, what were some of the reactions that you got from people about the losing track in Wing Commander? Well, <clears throat> I mean, the, fun the funny thing with interactive fiction is that you have to give everybody choices so they don't feel like they're constrained to any one path. But the problem is that you spend, you know, say, 50% of your time on the paths that aren't the optimum paths in the game. And then at the end of the day, you know, you're there going, hey, did you play down this track? Did you do this? Did you do this? And everyone's like, uh, no, I didn't. And you're like, oh, I just spent a year on that. What's the deal? And I, I, think, I think that... It really came home to me when I was sitting and I was um, talking to one of the Dynamics guys about the Rise of the Dragon. And I was mm -hmm. saying, yeah, I really loved it. I played it all the way through and I did this and I did this. And he's like, oh, did you go to this level and did you do this and did you meet this character? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and he's like, and he was like heartbroken. And, I was, and so, I mean, I guess it's one of those necessary evils because you have to do it so you feel like you have choice and you feel like that, um, you know, the world reacts to what you do. But you're also sitting there working on it going, well, I know about 50 or 60 percent of the people aren't actually ever going to experience this. And um, I don't know. I mean, I guess you need to do it so everyone feels happy about they've gone the losing track. Uh, they haven't gone the losing track, that is. So necessary and, evil. Right. But it seems like you've shortened the losing track. And progressively. It, progressively. And of course, with uh, filming, that made it uh, very necessary. Um, the great thing about the Wing Commander series, uh, I thought, was that it, it pushed upgrades at every new release. It, uh, you know, um, that is good. Uh, you know, when you're in a magazine that's advertising-driven, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it's also good uh, for the whole industry as a whole because people have a tendency to buy 
uh, more games when they buy new equipment because they want to find stuff that shows it off. And uh, certainly uh, uh, in the era of the, the Wing Commanders, the Wing Commanders showed off uh, new sound cards with Wing Commander 2. Uh, they certainly showed off uh, new uh, graphics cards <laughs> uh, with uh, Wing Commander 3, uh, which is one of the few FMV games that's ever spoken well of. And, um, and they showed uh, Electronic Arts how to spend lots of money in Wing Commander 4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I mean, I will say that the uh, the process that got me there is a long time. You mentioned Bad Blood and Times of Law. Yes. So I came from England, and I was used to programming on Commodore 64. And back in those days in England, it was tape drive. There was no disk drive. So I was really proud about Times of Law because everything fit in 64K. And there was this huge world, and you know, ventured around. and. You know, the game came out, and it came out over here, and you know, people didn't go, oh, well, it's really great because it can fit on in 64K. <laughs> they went, well, you know, it's cool and everything, but I'm playing this other game, and it comes on four discs, and it doesn't have as much of it. And I was sitting there going, hmm, I don't know about that. And about the same time, Microprose came out with F19, and I remember going up to Microprose because they distributed our stuff over in um, Europe, and they were, they were showing me F19, and I was like, man, this is the most incredible 3D simulation I've ever seen. You know, too bad it only runs at four frames a second on a 386.25, which back then was like a $10,000 machine. Like, nah, no one's ever going to be impressed or like this because you know, no one's got this machine. And it comes out and it's this absolutely huge hit. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, hmm, well, I, I guess there's a reason not to compromise and everything. So that's really what happened with Wing Commander. I said, OK, well, screw it. I'm going to use every single opportunity and tool I can get on the maximum available hardware right now to make the gaming experience as good as possible. Um, because my personal belief is that people aren't very objective about it. They're, they're subjective. They go, is this the best game I've seen? And they don't go, oh, is this the best game I've seen that runs in you know, 128K? Or is this the best game I've seen in CGA? They just go, is this the best game I've seen? So after I, I sort of made that decision point, and Wing Commander onwards was very much driven by, OK, let's make the best game possible, no holds barred from there on. And, Luckily, it seemed to work out. So, in the creative process, uh, as you were going from Times of War, which you basically wrote, you know, virtually all yourself, uh, to to Bad Blood, which you must have split off, you know, some of the programming on to the Wing Commander series, where you know more and more things were being done by by other people. Uh, can you describe for a little bit how your role changed from uh, from game to game, and uh, is starting your own company some desire to get back more hands on yourself or? Well, I mean, I, I think it is a design. I mean, actually, the one sad thing about game development nowadays is that in the old days, you could do everything yourself, and you could totally control the look, the feel, the sound. You know, you'd, you'd do the writing, you'd do the programming, you'd do the artwork, you'd do the sound, and you, it could be a one-man affair, and it could be an absolute single vision. And now, because of what everybody expects in terms of the quality of the product, you just can't afford to do that. I mean, it would take you... 20 years, and by the time it came out, it would be old technology. And so, you know, the sad thing is that you don't get to have that 100% level of control over the product. I mean, the good thing is that you get to work with a lot of other really talented people, and they, you know, in a lot of ways make your work better. Um, so, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, my role sort of moves more to being creative shepherd and sort of evangelist of exactly how it's going to work, and, you know, more away from the actual technician that's building all the building blocks of it. And um, I guess what I tried doing with Digital Anvil is I have felt a little bit recently that, you know, in the huge industry expansion, that it's kind of gotten away from a little bit of that sort of core vision on how products are built. And so what I'm trying to do with Digital Anvil is have a company that focuses on building great products, has less people on the teams, and allows the team the time they need to do the product and gives them the support they need to do it. Um, so we'll see if it works, but I mean, it's a good theory. It's something that me and a bunch of you know my peer group have been talking about for a long time, and we figured, okay, time to put up a shit up. Well, I'm pretty excited uh, about what you've told me about the new project, and we're going to come back to it later and uh, let you talk as much as you feel like you can uh, about that. <laughs> we want to move on to, to John here. Uh, I don't know how many people know, but um, you know, John was at Origin, uh, and uh, and worked with uh, uh, Chuck on uh, uh, 2400 AD and uh, and and moved over 
And actually, you know, Chris Roberts <laughs> stole the idea of Wing Commander from uh, Paul Neurath and John uh, <laughs> when they did Space Rogue, which was sort of, you know, Wing Commander with tunnels. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, then John moved from, uh, from there to, uh, to Softdisk Corporation, uh, where he was virtually doing a product, like a product of the month, weren't you, uh, yeah, with Softdisk? Every month. We had to, well, I started out um, after I left Origin, which was in uh, June of 88. I got there to uh, work on the, was it Apple II to Commodore 64 port of 2400 AD. And uh, while I was working on that, um, Paul Neurath. reviewed the Apple II version and that one was canceled, right? <laughs> no, the, well, no, the Apple II version came out. Um, I don't know how many copies it sold. It was a, I, I liked it. It was a fun game. Um, so I was doing my very first Commodore programming, converting um, the Apple II version of 2400 AD to the Commodore 64, which I had to learn pretty quickly. And uh, um, it was probably three months through the conversion when uh, Paul Neuroth really needed some help on, 20, on uh, Space Rogue. And because uh, he had to get the game done, it had been going on too long, so I was I was there to do the NPC code for him. Um, it ended up that uh, he actually didn't use my code in the game because I uh, I left pretty soon after that to kind of co-found another company, and uh, he ended up getting someone else to program the NPC stuff. But I uh, when I went on to the ne the next company, it was a uh, a conversion house called Inside Out Software just down the road from Origin in New Hampshire. And uh, I worked on the Might and Magic 2 conversion of the Commodore 64, and I worked on uh, various other ports. And, uh, and I finally decided to leave uh, Inside Out to go to Softdisk because it was an Apple II, it was an Apple II magazine, but it also did PC work. And, uh, and uh, this was in 1988 where the Apple II market was really dying hard. And I needed to actually learn the PC because it was, it was you know, the market. So um, I just called up the, the president of the company. I told him, you know, who I was and what I had worked on and stuff, and told him I didn't know anything about the PC at all, but I really want to learn how to program it. And he's like, "Come on down." So that was that was really cool that he, he let me come down and, and just learn how to program the PC, knowing nothing about it. And uh, while I was at Softdisk, I was doing um, utility work and some of my games I was porting to the PC, and I had to get. Uh, something done every single month. And uh, about a year and three months after going to work at Softdisk, um, I was really tired of not actually making real commercial games. I was doing these little month-long things. And, uh, and I told them that I was going to leave and I was going to like apply at LucasArts and like <laughs> actually get into making real games. And, uh, and so they said, okay, we'll start a monthly game disc. <laughs> and uh, so we needed some people. You know, we needed. We, we got a few people in there. John Carmack was one of the guys that we got a. He he had submitted some Apple II stuff, and so we got him as a programmer. We got uh, Lane Roth, who was an Apple II guy, and uh, I've worked with for a long time. And uh, Adrian Carmack was an intern, uh, an art intern, and so he got on the team. And um, and so we started doing games every single month, and. Um, Tom Hall, uh, who a, was a co-founder of id Software and Ion Storm, um, he was in the Apple II department, and he wasn't having as much fun in there as he was coming in at night helping design all of our games. And we could use all the help that we could you know, handle because we had to get these things done every single month, which is pretty hardcore. <laughs> and uh, so we made games every single month for about a year. And uh, they're on the, uh, the id Anthology on the vintage CD. Anyway, we were at... Uh, we were at Soft. Uh, we, we started this Gamer's Edge thing, and did some games for probably a few months when um, Carmack did this really awesome technology demo thing, and left it on my uh, Tom, Tom and Carmack stayed up really late at night and uh, did this, you know, duplicate Super Mario 3, but on the PC, and they uh, put it on my desk and I came in and I saw it and I was just shocked and I, I couldn't work for at least three hours because I've never seen anything like that on a PC before. And I knew that that was it. We we're out of here. <laughs> and uh, this is we could. It was. It was pretty funny. It was you know you see something like that and you just you know nothing like this is 
been done before on a PC. So wait a minute, before you were out of there, you know, <laughs> you know didn't you have sort of a fan club yep. that started? Uh, well, there's so a, there, there was a lot of things happening at the same time. Um, you know, he did the tech demo, and, um, and at the same time, I had done some, some games that I had ported from the Apple II to the PC and it got published. And, uh, and I was getting these, these letters, um, you know, handwritten back then before email, and I was getting these letters from, you know, supposedly a lot of people that, that liked this one <laughs> game that I did. And uh, they're, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I think I found a bug in your game. Write me and my, here's my address, my phone number. You know, please write. I'm 67 years old. And, you know, <laughs> all these different letters. And, and uh, I was reading a PC Games article. And it was talking about Cross, which was a shareware game that Scott Miller did. And uh, he had started Apogee. And... Um, I get. I, I was reading all about it, and and I got to the end of the article, and I saw the address and stuff, and I was like, no, I know that, I know that address. <laughs> and uh, I'm sitting there, and I just like look up on the wall right next to me. I'm like, no way. And all the letters, like about eight of them, they're all different different names, but the address was the same. And I was like, no. <laughs> I thought I had a lot of fans. <laughs> so. I was, I was, I, oh, I was, I went nuts. Carmack said you were upset because you found out that it was one guy and it was a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I, oh, I couldn't believe it. I, uh, anyway, I wrote this really evil letter back to him. And, uh, and I calmed down, like, the, the next day or two, I, I calmed down. I kept that letter. And, uh, and so I wrote him back another letter saying how pissed I was when I found out that he did this. And, um... <laughs> And I sent him the original one just so he could see how mad I was. <laughs> and he didn't even care. He was like, whatever, you know. So he calls up and he gets me on the phone and uh, was just like, oh, you know, this game was so great. I really, wanna, um, I really want you to do a game just like that for me and put it in the shareware market. And I had never even heard of shareware, but I was like, it sounds great. I could spend time actually more than a month and make a game. And, uh, <laughs> and so... Um, I, I said, but, you know, that game I did, that's, that's crap, you know, you check this out. And I showed, you know, show him a demo of something we we're doing, and he totally went nuts. And, um, you know, he's just, if you, do, you know, do a game for me, and, and uh, we'll publish it and all this stuff. And I was like, well, you know, if you're, if you're serious about it, um, you know, you'll have to advance us $2,000. And, Whoa. <laughs> yeah, 2000 bucks. So, um, well, he had 5000 in his bank account. <laughs> so that was, and he sent it to us. So that was a that was a pretty huge commitment on Scott Miller's part. And uh, we got the two thousand dollar check. And we're like, wow, this guy's hardcore. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so what we did was we started taking the computers home from Soft Disk at night, and especially on the weekends. <laughs> and uh, we we you better started, be careful. The litigation may yet occur. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's another part of the story. And, <laughs> So uh, we, we we take the computers you know home on the weekends and everything, and we're we're um, we were writing our first Commander Keen trilogy, which which um, when we when we told him we'd do a game for him, he he wanted to know what the game was about. We're like, dude, we'll just do a cool game, and, uh, <laughs> and he's like, I, so I know, see your design documents haven't changed. <laughs> so he he's, he goes, you know, well I want you know I'll give you two thousand bucks. I want to know what I'm paying for. So. So Tom Hall was in charge of the creative design of the game. So Tom wrote um, like one paragraph that described Commander Keen, and uh, we just sent it to him, faxed it to him, and he's like, "Okay, good, go." And he just wanted something. It was the high concept thing. He wanted, yeah, he just wanted something. So um, anyway, we worked for three months uh, after working on weekends, and we did the first trilogy, and uh, you know we had to make it fit on a 360k PC disc, and so we had. To, um, you know, we had to link stuff into the executable and do the LZE XE on it and, you know, just compress the hell out of the game. And uh, on December 14th of 1990, we released the very first uh, episode of Commander Keen, Marooned on Mars, into the inner, uh, onto BBCs back then. And, uh, and then the next, very next month, you know, we continued working at Softdisk. You know, we're doing our game a month, and we're working on this thing at night. <laughs> oh so it was weird. that was what, that was our life. Mm. And um, anyway, one month right after we got done with the game, and the very first month's profits came in, um, we got a check for ten thousand dollars, and we we're just like, "This is enough for all of us to live on." <laughs> so, 
we figure we're going to get it every month too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we just told Softdisk, look, you know, we're start, we, we started this product this product line six months earlier, and we're like, we got to go. This is too cool, and and so they you know they threatened to sue us and everything, and we worked out a deal where we would um, continue to make games for them while they got an in-house team up to speed. And so the first, um, the, in 1991, February 1st of 91 is when we formed id, id Software, the four of us. And um, in the very, until, until about um, August or September, that's what we did at id Software was we're getting money for our first game and we weren't even working on our next product. We were having to fulfill this soft disk thing. And so we did um, a whole bunch of games, which was every month again, you know. Um, but we learned a lot from all that. We actually did uh, the very first, our first 3D engine, which was Hover Tank 3D. Um, we did lots of cool side-scrolling games. We experimented with some different, with puzzle games and, and a lot of stuff. And we did a prototype of the Commander Keen, the next Commander Keen Trilogy's uh, game engine for them. And then uh, we did the second Commander Keen Trilogy in six months which was um, three months for Keen 4, two months for Keen 6, which we did right after 4 because it was a retail product we had to get out real quick. And then uh, Keen 5 took one month and uh, got that out um, December 15th of 1991. And then um, we started working on Wolfenstein right after that. And uh, Wolfenstein took six months. Um, we told our distributor... We told them what we were doing, and they're like, "Don't stir up that World War II thing," you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, you know, we're, you're, you're mowing down Nazis with a chain gun and stuff. It's really cool. <laughs> and they're just, you know, they went and they, they they couldn't believe, you know, it was made major controversial, and they they, you know, they were really scared. But they we, we did really good with our other games, so they're like, okay, you know. So we did Wolfenstein in six months, and then uh, immediately worked on Spear of Destiny, which took us two months. And, uh, and Wolfenstein was released on May 5th of 1992, which was actually one week after Ultima Underworld 2, which was, you know, they, they, Paul Neroth likes to talk about that because he <laughs> wants to make sure that he released the first texture map game out there. And, you know, and I tell everybody, yes, he, he totally did, you know, one, one week before we did. <laughs> and, actually, and actually, the only reason that Wolfenstein... 3D is texture mapped is because of Paul Neroth. I had kept in touch with him since he had started Blue Sky, and uh, I called him up while we were at Soft Disk, and, and uh, he he told me he was working on this new game that he couldn't tell me the the name of it, but they're using this really neat new technology called texture mapping, and uh, and after the phone conversation, I told Carmack, hey, they're doing this texture mapping thing, and uh, and he looks up in the air for about three seconds, and he goes, I can do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that was, you know, we had done it. After that, we did a texture map game called Catacombs 3D, but it was an EGA, so it wasn't real popular. You know, VJ, you know, Wolfenstein was in VJ, so it got really popular, and that's where everyone goes, oh, yeah, you guys did this first action game in, uh, in VGA and, and everything, which was pretty, it was, it was where the market was going. Um, so right after we finished Spear of Destiny, we started working on Doom in December of 92, and uh, you know during the entire year we did we, we finished it and it was that was a lot of work actually it took us a whole year for that game but uh, we <laughs> we released that on December 10th of 1993 and uh, Doom 2 took eight months that was released on October 10th of 94 and at the same time uh, I was working with Raven on Heretic and that got released December 23rd of 94 and then. Then uh, worked on Hexen and uh, Quake at the same time. It took about a year and a half for Quake. Do you remember the year that uh, Wolfenstein 3D won the uh, Best Action Game Award at the at the, so at the Software Publishers Con Association? And uh, when uh, Jay and, and you got up to accept it, and you <laughs> said, you know, thank you, this proves that shareware is uh, high quality. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody looked shocked because they didn't realize <laughs> that at that point they had voted for a shareware product. Yeah. <laughs> And we also said, hey, we'll be back next year, and we weren't anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs>
we were working on Doom. We thought we'd be there next year, but it took a year. So. That was also where Jay told me, he says, we've got, you know, we took a lot of heat for, you know, killing all those Nazis in the game, but this time we've got it licked. You're killing demons. Nobody can complain about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. We actually got a lot of comments about killing dogs, which was pretty funny. You can kill people, but not dogs. So that was... You know, and, so, and, and I think Quake bothers some people that there's, you know, Rottweilers in there and you can kill the dogs and you feel sorry for them. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Nolan, it seems like things have come full circle with, with PlayNet. You started out by putting machines in bars and restaurants, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, people would uh, pay as they play, and now it seems like you're putting machines in bars and restaurants and people are going to pay to play. Uh. Uh, why are you going the route of the, uh, you know, discrete hardware, the, uh, that route? I mean, isn't that a pretty expensive way to go when everybody's saying just web, web, web? Well, I believe that whenever you pioneer, you want to find low-hanging fruit. That is, how do you get into a marketplace in positive cash flow or as close to positive cash flow as you can? And when you push on technology, what you really want to be able to do is control things as much as possible. And right now, if you really look at the web and latency, it's really horrible. Um, and everyone who says that they've got some kind of a silver bullet, you know, it's, it's still the LA freeway at, at, uh, at rush hour, and even though you can create some passing lanes and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of problems with games over the net, particularly when you want to do massively parallel things. Um, so I felt that the coin-op world gives, has a lot of advantages. One, you can have a target hardware. Two, you can choose an intranet solution if you want to, since you have total control of the whole structure. This, the next area is that when you move into a new area, you want to be able to merchandise and, and make changes. I mean, it, it really started from a decision I made when I turned 50 to get back into the game business. I'd been fooling around with a lot of other areas, sort of going on the five year and out theory, that do something for five years and then do something completely different for five years, and that way you have a very interesting life. But, uh, <laughs> and, and I did you know, venture capital and restaurants and, and uh, telecommunications and microwaves and, and mapping and all that sort of stuff. And each one of them was interesting. But I decided that games were really a heck of a lot more fun. And so when you turn 50, you say, okay, um, I can reevaluate what, what's going on in my life and go back and do something that I've already done before. And so the fact that Nolan Bushnell was going to get back in the game business, I didn't think that anybody was going to be on bended knee welcoming me in my return. So I felt that there probably would be a, uh, that I had to come in, create a nice place, and then move out from there. Turns out there's never been a failed consumer game that was successful in the coin-op side. And I felt that the coin-op business was just horribly managed because it was becoming very, very insular. The, the business was collapsing in on itself because the games were getting to have such a high threshold of, um, or, or such a difficult learning threshold that people were leaving. I mean, uh, one year it was 6% uh, of the market was giving you 90% of the revenue, then 4, then 3, then 2. Um, 1983, the coin-op business was $18 billion at coin drop. Last year it was six. Um, that's a huge collapse. And it was really because people were getting a life and the games were getting so complex that unless you had a PhD in Mortal Kombat, and a typical person <laughs> going into an arcade had no chance. So I felt the business had to have a big reset. The big reset, I decided, had to, couldn't be in an arcade, because the arcade, getting a person <clears throat> from their home into an arcade was a lot different than getting them off a bar stool to another bar stool. And so I felt that, uh, <laughs> so I felt that a, uh, the right place was in bars and restaurants. And so I created a countertop game, PlayNet, 
It runs on a Pentium, uh, graphics assisted, 1.2 gigabyte hard drive, touchscreen interface, modem, two telephone handsets, um, and 32 megs of RAM running on NT, and uh, we're off and locked and loaded. The basic strategy is this. Download a game, you're talking about a game a month, we're downloading a game a, uh, a, game a week. And um, so constantly renewable content, you don't have to blow up the theater every time you change the movie, which is sort of the point out model right now. Um, that it's not, and it's connected to the net. We're also doing tournaments, because it turns out that there are a lot of states that allow games of skill to be prized. And so we can now have prizes and cash and what have you. We have chat, but not chat with typing, because Bubba don't type. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. But Bubba does spill beer all over the touch screen. That's okay. <laughs> as long as he's put a quarter in first, he can spill it wherever he wants. Um, we take, but quarters, that's one thing. Credit cards are another. Because since we're on the net, now we can do credit cards and cash. Our machine takes ones and fives. And so um, the objective is to have games, multiplayer games, tournaments, chat with handsets. Now, we use the protocol of, um, of a chat room, but with voice files. So now one jerk can't, mo uh, can't dominate and that sort of thing. And plus, we can now have audio chat on top of games over the network. Now, this is where I do my imitation of the Statue of Liberty. Um, because give me your tired, your worn, your humbled, huddled programs longing to be free, because we're going to have an open platform. And anybody who wants to publish, just write it to NT, we'll give you an API, and uh, we'll give you a percentage of the coin drop. And it's real easy. It would be real fun, brings a whole new idea to shareware. And then, of course, if people are playing it and having fun in bars and restaurants all over the world, uh, clearly there are going to be people that are going to want to do it at home. So we see it as a good way to merchandise games, to get <coughs> trial, and also to be in this wonderful network. We've got this thing called CollegeNet going, in which we'll have all the colleges all over the nation all over the world, linked up for massively multiple player games. Uh, and, uh, I mean, just think of having a Doom engine, okay, with a sphere of influence so that you can only see a few people around you. But we want to have 10,000 in the same game. Big arena. It's collapsing. Costs you $5 to enter. Three shots. You can take three hits but then three hits and you're out. Last guy standing gets 10 grand. <laughs> Does that sound yeah. fun? Boy, I want to do that. <laughs> uh, then we'll add, add one other So have you thing. done the research? How many states allow skill-based contests Pardon? like that? How many states allow skill-based contests like that? There's about uh, 23 that allow it, for sure. There's another 15 that... Uh, we're going to try, you know. Mm. <laughs> it's better to ask forgiveness often than permission. Uh, and then there's several that, you know, you just go to hard jail. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, there's some, all kinds of fun sociology. Imagine if you could now choose your jersey colors. Now that says that now friends can locate other friends in cyberspace. And so they say, okay, you wear the green and the blue and, and all that. Because you figure out, I'll watch your back, you watch my back. And so what we've introduced is cyberspace gang warfare. <laughs> <laughs> and so the sociology of the thing could get really fascinating. <laughs> well, I think it will. But uh, I don't know if you can take credit for introducing it, because there's a lot of quake clans out there that uh, <laughs> are pretty well uh, beating people up. But, so, but, but you can't do 10,000, right? Not yet. <laughs> but we can work on that. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I so got the platform. You write the code. So what do you think, John? Do you think uh, Daikatana death matches uh, are going to be possible uh, over this system, or are you going totally a different direction? Uh, well, Daikatana is using the Quake technology, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, 
it'll probably go up to 32 players. <laughs> okay, we'll do 32, and then 32, and then 32. We'll partition. Maybe hook, hook we'll up put like doors. Networks. We'll put doors between them. You know, partition them on servers. That'd work. Yeah, you could like uh, have like small groups of games, and then whoever wins there can go on to the next phase right. and just kind of get everybody together. You do that. That's got to be fun, <laughs> isn't it? Oh yeah. Well, we we had talked about the possibility of. Uh, when we were doing Quake, we would have, um, you know, New York versus L.A., and we'd have these gangs, and, you know. Yeah. Which is what clans kind of turned out to be. But we were, we were envisioning, you know, some huge numbers of players. And, um, and that's kind of what it's, you know, our original idea was we'd have a, some, some New York, um, there'd be all these clans in New York, or groups of players, and, and the best would form a team, and they, they'd have their own little competitions, and finally create this core team of like six players or something and uh, then we'd have LA do the same thing they have their own little set of tournaments and get down to a core group that that's their killer group and then you'd have um, you know towns you know big cities major cities fighting each other to see who the best city in the US is and mm-hmm. stuff like that and they're just they're doing that um, they're starting to organize clan warfare stuff at the clan you know war council North American war council and stuff like that so <laughs> It's happening by itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. So, Chris, what model uh, do you see in the future for uh, for multiplayer uh, play? Or do you do you think this uh, collapsing arena idea is the approach that you'd be interested in, or a persistent universe, or what? Well, um, I guess considering one of the projects we're working on is uh, hoping to have you know the ability to have you know ten thousand people online at at the same time, then. I would I would definitely say yes. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of technical issues with uh, getting enough people at one time in the same space in action. So, I mean, I guess you know the way that we're looking at handling it is very much, you know, let's get 16 or 32 people in one space in action, and but everyone sort of um, on the equivalent of this huge virtual um, chat server that's dressed up to feel like the world and universe that we put you in. So everyone has a reputation, everyone has an affinity with a house that we're calling in this game um, that we're working on. So it has, it has some similarities to what uh, they've done with Quake World, although we're trying to do something that's a much more um, persistent universe that sort of you know, just exists for a year or two years. And it's modeled. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what I've noticed is that uh, there seem to be a lot of different tiers of, of customers with regard to, to latency. There are those who only play games where latency doesn't really affect much. Uh, there are those who will play uh, Quake free as long as, and put up with the latency as long as it's free. Uh, there are those who pay a little bit more for, for Duango or 10 with a, a, you know, a low latency solution. And there are those who just you know, are somewhere in between. Uh, what, are you th- what are you planning on doing with this project? Are you going to design so that latency doesn't matter, or are you, do you have a latency solution? Or Well, I mean, I, I think we have as much of a latency solution as everyone else does, which means that you do <laughs> as good as you can, and you, know, you do things like predictive um, you know, intelligence on the emotion right, and stuff. Um, I mean, I will say that the one thing I have noticed with online is that, um, and it's the problem that we wrestle with, and I'm sure everyone else wrestles with, is that you know, if you want to hit a mass audience, it has to be free online. So you have to figure out, you know, how you can, how how you can afford to do that for free. Um, but I mean, I, I know for I know for you know, uh, me when we were like, for instance, Dabbler is a great example with Battle.net, right? Mm-hmm. We, you know, we all got Dabbler in the office, and we spent you know two three weeks, you know, killing Dabbler about three or four times until you know we killed him on every difficulty level with all our buddies. And that was just very cool because for the first time it felt like the multiplayer experience that I get at the office because you know we've all got high speed Pentiums and we've got a very fast network and it's cool to play games at work which you know everyone in this room is okay for but the rest of the world doesn't get that experience. Um, you know it's like you know I go visit Iron Storm and they're all like quake matching. I phone them up and all I can hear is <laughs> ah! <laughs> God damn it! I'm like uh, all right okay so. Um, you know, and so actually for me, you know, the coolest thing is seeing games come along now where finally that experience that's so cool for everyone in the industry that's been playing multiplayer games for years um, is becoming available at home. And you know, whether or not the internet is perfect, and you know, I know it isn't, but it's the best way to get that experience at home, which is cool because I just want people to, you know, have the same 
I guess, sense of satisfaction that I do when, you know, I blow someone away or I, you know, take their base out at CNC or whatever, so. Right. Besides the internet, which uh, gets around the problem in the small group, with your collapsing arena idea, are you going to design uh, around latency, or are you just going to put up with it, or do you we have, have a, whole, a... We have a whole bunch of projects that don't, you know, that are, that are, we call them latency adverse, which we really don't care that much about. We're actually targeting a market which doesn't care about that as much, because most of it are people that are pretty well lubricated with alcohol anyway. Uh, so you want so, latency, basically. So, so latency helps. Yeah. You know, latency is our hey. friend. <laughs> but, uh, and, and really adults. And, and, and one of the things that I, I want to point out is that don't forget that demographically right now, teenagers are the smallest group that they're, that's been in years. It's called a baby bust. And so to, if you want testosterone to fundamentally lubricate your business plan, it's, a, it's not a good idea right now because everybody's getting older. And so the real, uh, the real area that you want to focus on is how can I get women to play? How can I get older business people to play? How can I enfranchise kids who are, uh, you know, under, under 10. And uh, the other markets are fun and, and, you know, they're really exciting and the, the 8 to 18 year old male, 8 to 35 year old uh, computer jock, that's one thing, but um, we really want to focus and try to broaden our demographics um, to people that maybe have, uh, you know, CPU processing times that are equivalent to old uh, 386s instead of the Super Pentiums in terms of, I mean, if we talk about us as being a 60 hertz massively parallel computer, you know, some of us, I think, have dropped down to about 40 now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one last generic question that I want to ask you, and then I want to make sure that if we uh, have some questions, at least here in the audience, that uh, we get a couple of them out. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask each one of you in turn, uh, what is the biggest mistake you ever made in game design? And uh, since I started uh, before one way, I'm going to start the other way. John, what was the biggest mistake that you can think you ever made in game design? Um, geez, probably not spending enough time on Quake's uh, single-player game. <laughs> That's probably it. Um, my current game is, you know, I spent a, a lot of time on my current game's game design. And, and Quake is a really great multiplayer game, but uh, I really like to play single-player stuff, and I really wish that I had spent more time doing doing uh, better design on the single player game but it was it was you know the situation and everything um, that was probably the biggest mistake Chris uh, I think it was times the law and I built this sort of gauntlet style top down view uh, game and I was real because I, I loved gauntlet when I was playing in the arcades and so I wanted to do something that had more depth and and you know you could go around and you could talk to people and um, you know, so I was really in love with this sort of mono scale, but you know, instead of just being going on these contained maps, I wanted this huge world, and so I built this huge world, and then you know, I would leave a town, and I'd walk for about 20 minutes, and nothing would happen, <laughs> and, and finally I'd get to the other town, and you know, I'd be going, hmm, you know, that's not so much fun. So at that point, I started, okay, well, I'm going to sort of invent random monsters here, so as I'm walking from the towns, I've got something to do. And about that point, I said, hey, you know, look, next time I'm doing something like this, if there's ever a point where I'm making a game and I'm putting stuff in the game to get around something that isn't fun, maybe that shouldn't be there in the first place. And so, you know, interestingly enough, I was like, okay, well, I think at that point, I, you know, I was spending a lot of time to make it fun between the cities. And so I was like, well, you know, next time I should probably have like an overall map. And then I say, I'm going to go from this city to the city and, and sort of scope the action to, you know, where I had the areas of interest in the game. And, um, so it was pretty funny because that's the way the Richard had with his Ultima design originally, and then he moved to monoscale with Ultimas later on. And you know, I, I would be there on like Ultima Seven, and they'd be spending you know two years with the level designers making sure every little single part of the map was interesting because even though that wasn't part of the main story, you could wander off over there. And so I guess you know, for me, um, I just felt like it was very important to focus on what the fun aspects of the game were, and then sort of exclude the rest of them. And that sort of actually drove Wing Commander, because Wing Commander was just very much focused on, okay, I want to do 
space dog fighting and that's it. And um, so I guess you learn from your mistakes. Well, the smart people do. <laughs> <laughs> no one, what, what do you think your biggest mistake was in the game biz? Oh boy. I got so many of them. Um, I don't think I can limit it to just one. The, probably the one technically that was the biggest blunder was not uh, was deciding to save the cost of a uh, connector that had a couple of extra pins in the Atari 2600 cartridge slot and not having a read-write line. That really cut, I mean, this will sound funny, but we really thought that, that the 2600 was going to play about 16 games and that 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 was all, you know what I mean? Because we thought it was really clunky. I mean, it only had 128 bits of RAM. Um, you know, so that's not bytes. Those are bits. That's, uh, and so by not having a read-write line, it uh, really said that the RAM, the ROM cartridges couldn't be augmented with that real bad thing. The other part um, was a product called Video Music. Uh, we built... 150,000 chips, we built 75,000 units, and we sold six. Uh, <laughs> and that was really, a, that was, it's a little more than that, but at full price, you know. Um, if only there'd been infomercials then, you could have done the miracle thing. <laughs> yeah. But the, re but the real thing uh, in the game business that I regret is selling Atari. I think, uh, you know, it was a thing where I was young. To Warner or selling it, period? Selling it to Warner. Well, you know, I mean, boy, nobody could have screwed it up as bad as they did. But, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, well, it was, maybe, maybe the Tremils. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you start a company, it's sort of like your baby. And even though you've sold it, you kind of watch it and you hope it doesn't go to prison. And, you know, <laughs> And various things, and uh, and it's and it's been really disappointing to see my baby hacked to death, uh, you know, through just blunders, and uh, and I kind of feel like, I mean, there's, you know, one of the things that people don't realize. Imagine the Atari 800, which was technically superior in a lot of ways, a lot of things, but. Remember, and, and you, some of you young guys won't even know this happened, but can you imagine a company that actually said, if you write software for our platform, we'll sue you? <laughs> How to gain influence and, and win people. But essentially, in the, the Atari 800, after I sold the company, I mean, we, we had all this stuff designed and, and created pretty much before I left. But then... The Warner Marketing got a hold of it and said, well, this is clearly a closed pl platform. It's worked in the video game business. So, so not only do they not uh, release the, the specs or any authoring tools or anything like that, they said, hey, we're not going to let you distribute, and you clearly, and we're going to take you to court. So while Jobs was out evangelizing, Atari was saying, thou shalt not. And, of course, the history is, is history. But... It, you know, Atari could have had it all, but just a little bit of intelligence. Uh, yes, sure absence. Now, my biggest mistake tonight was not watching the clock, so we're probably only going to have room for like uh, two questions from the audience. So, uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, just uh, if you can, a uh, uh, question right here. Yeah. The products of these two gentlemen, I'm sure, have greatly influenced everybody in this room. I'd be very interested to know. Which products have greatly influenced them? Oh, excellent question. Since your products have influenced so many people in the room, which products have influenced you? So uh, you've been in the middle all the time, Chris, so you start off this time. Okay. Uh, well, I would say that the very, very early days uh, when I was programming over in England, a game called Elite, which came out on a machine called the BBC Micro. <laughs> When I came over here, um, there was a game Larry Holland did, which was Battlehawks 42, uh, which was fantastic. Um, most of the 
you know, all the Infocom early adventure games I used to play like crazy. I still play adventure games. I love them. I love the, the LucasArts games. Um, recently, I would say I kind of split my time between playing a lot of multiplayer um, strategy games. CNC is the one I still play now, even though I was playing it two years ago, mainly because I think it's for a multiplayer game when you're a good player at it, it's the best. And it's actually better balanced than even Red Alert was. Um, and I think it's better um, for like fast-paced multiplayer action than some of the other stuff, even though they're all, they're all great games. Um, I was very impressed by Adabla recently. Um, I thought that that was the best application I'd seen with uh, integrating multiplayer over the internet in a product. It was just incredibly slick. Um, so um, I guess that's kind of my playlist. John? Um, well, the very first game that really impressed me a lot was Pac-Man back in, geez, I think it was 82 or something, because um, it had color and it had a very different game design. It, it was not shooting things. It was, you know, staying away from things, which was very, very interesting. And that's, uh, that really got me interested in, in designing games because I, I could actually, from, seeing, from, from watching that game, it really looked like there was a endless possibilities to game design because it wasn't they they, they weren't following the trend, which was just shooting things, shooting aliens. Um, after that, I was a real big Apple II guy, and uh, probably um, Castle Wolfenstein was a really was a really interesting game because it was very different. Um, played a, played a lot of Infocom stuff, and the, those guys were great. Um, Lucas Arts was also a really big influence. Maniac Mansion and uh, some of their adventure stuff, um, and definitely Diablo was a was a big influence. That was just it was very different. Um, I didn't get into the real time strategy stuff as as much. I mean, it was fun and everything, but I really I like first person action stuff, so <laughs> I kind of didn't eat it up as much. Um, and I really like uh, I really like the first person action thing. So I really watch my genre and take notes and try and improve and push it further. Um, but the really there haven't been too many things that have really impressed me a whole lot. Um, just a, just a few different games. Noah, this is a little bit harder. But in terms of sort of standing on shoulders, I think uh, Steve Russell's programming on a PDP-1 of uh, Space, Sa War. Space, War. Space War was a uh, very important game for me. I played that a long time ago in the arcades. Yep. It's not uh, that big, though. <laughs> and, um, and, a, and a game called Chicago Coin Speedway, which was a driving game before video games, which used which is a real Rube Goldberg of, uh, of slide projectors and various things. But over the years, uh, games that um, I particularly liked have been, uh, it's one that you don't hear very much, but uh, Fool's Errand, I thought, mm -hmm. was a very interesting uh, collection of little games that were, were pretty clever. Uh, of course, Tetris was something that was very important to me. Um, I've, been, I've been a Doom, big Doom player. Um, I currently uh, am playing with my son's... Uh, a lot of Warcraft 2, um, which uh, I, I can say that I have a seven-year-old that is a Warcraft 2 level editor. Uh, <laughs> I think that there's a game that is uh, not on anybody's list here, but it's one called Pajama Sam from Humongous, which uh, I think is for my uh, two-year-old is absolutely a, uh, a, uh, a super hit, and it's a it's got depth and humor and, and really some pretty good stuff. So if any of you have kids, I highly recommend it. I thought of some other games. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Ultima series, which, was, which I re really liked a lot. Um, and a lot of Squaresoft's games, like Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy III. Um, that stuff is... I, I love Squaresoft stuff. Um, I think those. The, I just want to kind of mention the the RPG side of, of 
of things because I really like that that genre and, and we're planning on <laughs> on hitting it. Um, okay, okay, good. There's one more question. The first real hand I see. If not, thank you very much for attending. And oh, here's one. Yeah, there is one way in the back. Oh well, there's one right here. Okay, go. Say, uh, has success changed your lives at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nolan already told you it was five years and out. <laughs> now the question was, has success changed your lives at all? Uh, we'll start with Nolan. Absolutely. Um, I've been rich. I've been poor. Rich is best. Uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> The thing that you have to do, though, is there's only so much eating and drinking and living money that you have. The rest of it's sort of poker playing money. And it determines how big a game you can get in. And, um, and I think building in the final analysis is the most fun. And uh, if you can build better and more efficiently, I think you have a good life. Um, and I think that, that there's some times when... Uh, making a lot of money, you can become insufferable for a while. But uh, then you have to get whacked to the side of the head with a few slings and arrows, and it turns you back into a real person. And I think it helps uh, both ways. OK. Mr. Fly Yellow Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have some cars. and <laughs> uh, Basically, um, I, uh, I, don't know, I, I like cars, so I got to buy some cars and get into cars, um, you know, get a cool house. Um, and basically, I really spend a lot of time playing games and making them. I really don't spend too much time doing anything else. I don't watch TV. I, I rarely go to movies. So I'm still doing what I want to do, but I can really spend time doing it all, you know, constantly now because I don't have, you know, I'm working and I'm making money doing what I like to do, and that's... That's what I do most of the time. Um, uh, I think it's cool that my parents really get a big kick out of it because they're they always tell you know people find out that they that they're the parents of the guy that wrote Doom and so they they can they talk to a lot of people because of that because they got <laughs> Doom shirts and everything. <laughs> but yeah, mo mostly uh, I. I you know, I can get involved with a lot more things now just because of, you know, the stuff that I've done and everything. But what I really spend a lot of time doing is still making games and playing them. And Mr. Micro Brewer? Uh, well, I mean, I definitely think it's uh, cool that I don't have to listen to my dad asking me when I'm going to go back and finish my degree and, <laughs> <laughs> and get a job that has a little longer lifespan. Uh, but I mean, actually, I gotta say, I mean, you know, like, you know, success is great and everything, but the, the coolest thing, if you really love what you're doing, is that it just enables you to do what you want. And um, that's the important thing for me. That's the nice thing that I got from it, is that I can pretty much, in the software side, making games, get to do the games I wanna make. And, um, you know, you know I, wish, I wish that upon everyone here, because it's cool when you get there, and it's really tough when you don't. And I remember when I wasn't there and I used to have to beg and plead and tell them that, you know, yeah, okay, well, times will not sell very well, but come on, you really got to go for this Wing Commander thing because it's going to be cool. And you, know, you need to, like, give me an artist so I can do that. And, um, you know, that takes a lot of energy. So it's nice not to expend that energy. And that's what I like about success. And I do understand that I missed somebody in the back. So if you'll be honest and jump up and ask that question. I have a question about... Um the uh, question is, uh, I talked a lot about multiplayer projects. Where are solo players going? Chris? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think um, in the future there's going to be two get style of games. There's going to be immersive, single-player games that are primarily story-driven. Um, you know, I know I'm still interested in making those. You know, an adventure game, sort of, you know, Monkey Island's a good example of that. A Wing Command is a good example of that. Um, it, they're, they're just a different kind of environments. I think right now, um, you know, myself and a lot of, uh, you know, I know John and a lot, of, you know, it sounds like Nolan, very enamored by the whole social computing aspect of 
being in a world and environment with a bunch of other people that are real people because at the end of the day, um, you know, no matter how great we are at programming, our artificial intelligence just doesn't cut it to the unpredictability and the intelligence that a real person has. And so you feel a real satisfaction from playing a one-on-one -on -one game or a one-on-20 -on game against other people. And so I think that's, you know, very attractive and interesting. But I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, I mean, you know, the solo game, I mean, I know I just, you know, recently played Instinct 76, had a cool storyline, had a cool look. You know, I played it for a week or two. I had fun. I mean, it was worth the $50, $60 it cost. And, um, you know, that's the experience I can do myself and um, in my own time. And I think that's always going to be there. So, I mean, I think, you know, multiplayer is going to become a much stronger portion of the market. It's not going to take away from uh, the solo game. I think multiplayer is really just going to expand the marketplace and give a new kind of experience there. And I guess what you're seeing is a lot of sort of heat and passion because it's the new thing and we're all sort of enamored of it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I still like stories. And if you want to be involved and have someone tell you a story, um, it's very difficult to do that on a multiplayer game. And I know because I'm going through that whole design problem right now. And so at the end of the day, I still like to play adventure games. And you know, I'll play those solo and have a lot of fun. I don't know about you, John, but... I feel the same way. I love, I love single player games, of course. I love multiplayer games, too. But um, actually, in multiplayer, I don't like so much the whole clan warfare where there's like a million people in one game just destroying each other randomly. I, I really like the one-on-one -on -one game where you, you have a map that's, that's, that's interesting and you hunt the other guy down and you really get paid back for your knowledge of that area. Um, it, it's, I've seen it firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more fun to me than just the random violence that happens in just complete, you know, huge multiplayer environments. But uh, I really like the single player game because it's, it's custom, it's, it's created for the, the player to go through and you know when you're done with that then you can spend all your time in multiplayer and and nowadays games you know we, we have to make these games that have so much stuff in them we have to we have to have a really great multiplayer segment of the game we have to have a really great single player segment we spend a lot of time and money developing both of these and we really have to we have to look at it and say well these are really almost two different games we're creating one game for one person to go through to follow a story and, and have a certain experience, which is very different than a multiplayer game. And uh, now, it's almost like developing two games nowadays, because the expectations are so high for these like multimedia extravaganzas that we're creating, and uh, it costs more money to create them too. So um, the, the multiplayer thing is definitely getting stronger, just like Chris said, but there's, I can't see it taken away from the single player game. When I, was, when, when I got Dark Forces, I played it, I loved it, got finished with it, and I did not feel bad that it didn't have multiplayer because that's not what it was all about. And uh, it's, but, it's but really... it's basically your fault there's a multiplayer expectation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's well, true. the thing is, every game doesn't have to um, do the exact same thing as the last game. Um, as long as enough games come out and everybody's satisfied, that's cool. You don't have to say that one game comes out and it is better than everything else before it. Yeah, I, no. I agree. I think that there's going to be both markets. Uh, in fact, I think the single-player market will continue to be the dominant and, and actually the bigger for quite some time. But I always set little bogeys for myself, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is I want to displace every game of solitaire that's being played <laughs> in the business class on airlines. And if I can do that with one of my games, I'll consider that to have been a, a suitable uh, bogey to have achieved. That's cool. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me, and I hope it was a real pleasure for you. And I'm firmly convinced more than ever that these really are legends of computer gaming. Uh, <laughs>